Nothing like starting your day with a shot of Kentucky bourbon. Hi, I'm Paul. Former handle, Dernza. I want to thank uh, Dark Tangent for inviting me to DEF CON 32. More importantly, I want to thank Dark Tangent for building a community of hackers. Hackers that have been invited, not only in the private sector, but also for our hackers that work in government. And it's so good to see so many of you today. Thanks a lot for coming and joining us for what will undoubtedly be the best DEF CON ever. Hey, let me begin. You know, it's been 180 days, six months since I left Cyber Command and the National Security Agency. I retired from the Army and had a number of different experiences. It's just been incredible. I thought I'd share some. A couple months ago, I decided to look for a job. And the job that I was looking for, they said, hey, we have to do a background check on you. I said, fantastic. Imagine my surprise when the background check comes back and it says, unable to confirm US citizenship. <laughs> wow, what a story that would be. I wonder if the Washington Post knows. So after a informed and impassioned conversation with the Social Security Administration, they invited me to visit their local office, which I did. Now, when you come into the local Social Security Administration office, there's like a ticket booth, you know, like you would have at a deli, right? And I saw like tickets, but it wasn't like one through 10. It was like one through 10 and then also num uh, letters there. And I was thinking, letters and numbers. Wow, I better take many tickets because I want to get seen fast. Who knew that that's both monitored and frowned upon by the Social Security Administration. <laughs> the Department of Motor Vehicles, the DMV, amazing place to be. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, a number of my friends and family indicated to me that I should be very careful in terms of what I do when I go to the DMV. Why is that? Because if you're not precise in the information that you bring, they're going to send you back. Are you able to see the slide yet? Oh, that's unfortunate. OK, that's me at the DMV. That's before they send me home two times to get the right information for my license. I'll spare you the second shot. But here's what I would tell you. They didn't require me to take a road and a written test, so I thought it was at least above the curve there. Last thing I would say, imagine after three decades of serving and not being able to bring your cell phone to work. Right, that's a big deal, man. We don't allow cell phones and where we work at the NSA and Cyber Command. And then I got this email saying, hey Paul, leave your cell phone, your iPad, your Apple Watch at home, you're going to DEF CON. Wow, good to see some things haven't changed in my life. Hey, today I want to talk about the journey of NSA and Cyber Command and cyberspace. What I want to talk about is our beginnings, I want to talk about where we were, what we've done, some of the impacts that we've had. I also want to talk about the opportunities and challenges and then conclude with, hey, this is really what we need to do collectively going forward. The picture that's shown there is the National Security Operations Center. It is among the most sensitive places in the National Security Agency. We don't take visitors. It's not a stop on the hop on, hop off tour for DC. And it's one of the places where we're able to provide indication warnings to the President, the Secretary of Defense, senior military commanders about what's happening in the world, what's going on. And if you think about it, this allows our leaders to have knowledge. They see first, they know first, and hopefully they can act first. When I took over NSA in the spring of 2018, I established a series of wake-up conditions. What are wake-up conditions, you ask? Wake-up conditions are this idea that, hey, I want the officer on duty to call me when something happens, right? There might be 
Americans in danger, there might be a hostage crisis, there might be something that's going on in the world that is going to get alerted to the President and the Secretary of Defense. I always like to have that information first before my boss knows. Now here is how the world has changed in the past even five years. The first year, three times I was called. Three times an entire year. My last month in the job, over 10 times I was called. And it was a very interesting relationship that developed between the senior operations officer and my wife, who normally took the calls at our home. It went something like this. It's for you. It's them. Good luck. So that's the world in which we live in today. The scope, scale, sophistication, and speed of what we're facing is tremendously different. But if we want to understand where we are today and where we need to go, it's my belief that we have to take a look at where we've been, what shaped us, what we've experienced, and what has actually occurred. Next slide, it's 2008. We find out the Russians have conducted an intrusion into our classified systems using simple USB keys. Air jumping capability with malware that allows them to establish a beachhead in our secret and top secret systems. From this intrusion, really three things happen. First of all, really this sense that combat operations come to a stop in the theaters of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Secondly, monopolizes the intention of the incomplete Department of Defense and the Pentagon. And thirdly, the idea is shattered within our Department of Defense that our classified systems are truly secure. Now the Pentagon's response to this is called Operation Buckshot Yankee. A farcical, maybe comical attempt, maybe what you would say is a shit show, in terms of what goes on with regards to the deployment by a foreign adversary into our classified networks. We don't understand the, we don't understand the threat, we don't understand the malware, we don't understand the technology. We have a number of different commands to come, come together, action officers that are trying to figure out what's going on, counting computers, more computers one day, less computers the next day, the idea that the infection is spreading, it is truly a mess. It's finally cleared up in the fall of 20, uh, 2008 when the National Security Agency is able to identify the threat, identify the vector, and then identify the way that we've got to return assurance to our classified systems. Okay, that's one intrusion. But what I would tell you from the past and why this is so important is that intrusion sets off a series of actions in our department. Then Secretary of Defense Gates says that, hey, maybe we need to think about a new command that operates in cyberspace. We'll call it U.S. Cyber Command. And we want this command to take a look at securing the nation in cyberspace, defending our networks and our data, and providing support to other military commanders. Four officers were given the job of designing and selling this concept and educating a whole slew of leaders within the Pentagon. Jen Easterly, who you'll hear about or you'll hear from later today, S.L. Davis, T.J. White, and myself. Now this is 2009. We were talking about things like, how does an email transition the internet? How do you work TCP IP? How do you take a look at hunting and penetration testing? How do you take a look at building a secure architecture? We were having this conversation, I realized, with people and senior leaders that had never turned on their computers. In fact, their assistants were printing their emails, providing them to the leaders, and the leaders would write out the response. And the assistant would send it back to the person that asked the question. So we had to think differently. Because I would share with you 
sometimes new ideas in the Pentagon are not warmly greeted, particularly when those ideas have a request for money and people. So what do we do? We developed a story. We talked about networks that were like neighborhoods. We talked about security in terms of the way that you put on locks and alarm systems on your house, the idea of a neighborhood watch, the idea that we had to think differently about a domain of cyberspace than we'd ever thought about before. And these four officers took this briefing with these type of slides to a number of different senior leaders within the Pentagon. Being able to tell that story, being able to actually answer the questions that came up so readily. The command's approved in 2010. A new four-star headquarters is established. And then over a series of years, we build a force. We build a force of hackers, we build a force of defenders, we build a force of analysts, we build a force across all our services. And our first adversary is ISIS. ISIS, in the terms of being able to understand in 2015, the fact that this terrorist organization was starting to have tremendous success in Iraq and Afghanistan, I'm sorry, in Syria and Iraq. And as they had tremendous gains across the battle space, they were also having tremendous gains in an information operational campaign that they were conducting to raise money, to recruit forces, and to proselytize. Guess what? We had tremendous challenges at Cybercom. We had really no infrastructure. We had limited capabilities, and we had really no authorities. And this first foray into being able to battle an adversary was not quite successful for U.S. Cyber Command. And then things changed in 2016. 2016, as the, show, as the slide shows here, brought together our best warriors on the Internet with our best warriors on the ground. Special Operations Forces were our number one calling and our number one advocate to what we were doing. Folks like Tony Thomas and Joe Votel, leaders within the special operations community said, we need to have a virtual presence to battle ISIS. And that virtual presence appeared. We had an infrastructure. We started to get capabilities. We had limited authorities. And suddenly, the ability to take on ISIS became our number one goal and our number one success story. The ability for ISIS to produce high-definition def, uh, high visuals, the ability for ISIS to set up multi-language websites, the ability for ISIS to communicate broadly was taken on and was taken down. And in fact, we matched the fires on the ground with fires on net. Now, you would think after that experience, in 2015 and 2016 that we would be prepared for what information operations from a determined adversary might bring to our country. The 2016 presidential election is well covered. I'm sorry, if we can go back one slide, please. Go back one slide. A number of different reports that were released in terms of what the Russians were doing in the in this run-up to the 2016 presidential election. Their equation was pretty set. It went something like this. We'll take their best intel services, the SVR, the FSB, the GRU. We'll combine them with a series of proxies, like the Internet Research Agency out of St. Petersburg, Russia. We'll be able to take a very, very honed message, feeding both sides of divisive issues, and then leverage the technologies of bots and U.S. social media organizations to feed a message broadly within the United States. Here's the thing the Russians didn't plan for. The fact that we did nothing. We failed in 2016 to protect our democratic processes. 
And so as I came to the command and the agency in 2018, there was certainly a sense, whether it was from Congress, whether it was from the White House, whether it was from the Secretary of Defense, that this election in 2018, the midterms, was going to be completely different. Here was our, our equation in 2018, a new organization. It's called the Russia Small Group. It was the idea of bringing the best of NSA and U.S. Cyber Command together. It was adding really capable leaders. Two leaders whose names you probably recognize. Ann Neuberger led the NSA contingent of the Russia Small Group. She's going to talk later today here at DEF CON. Tim Hawk, he led, the, he led the element from U.S. Cyber Command. He's now Dernzer, Commander U.S. Cyber Command. And we took it and combined these new leaders, this new organization, with a new strategy. A strategy of defending forward. The idea that we're no longer going to take some type of adversary trying to interfere or influence our electoral process. And so we took the idea of hunt forward operations. Let me talk about hunt forward operations for a second. Hunt forward operations. The idea that was brought to me by a young Air Force captain and a young NSA analyst that said, hey, General, maybe if we take a defensive team and we go to a country that invites us and we hunt on their networks with that country, we can discover what the Russian tradecraft, their technology, and their malware was all about. Sounds good to me. But here's the even better part of what they thought about. The idea of taking the malware and the tradecraft that they had seen in a place like Ukraine and sharing that not back with Fort Meade and the silos that exist within the National Security Agency and U.S. Cyber Command, but how about with Virus Total, a cybersecurity consortium that suddenly is able to attribute, signature, and develop many times an antidote to the malware that we saw and then broadcast it to the world. That's the difference, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of being able to defend our democracy, work with a series of partners, and think differently. The 2018 elections, incredibly successful in terms of being able to deliver a safe and secure election. The 2020, the 2022 elections all follow the similar path. Here's why this is so important to the agency in command and to, I would say, what we do in terms of election security. First of all, it brought to the idea of where we work in government about the power of partnership. It begins within our organizations internally. NSA and Cyber Command, organizations that need to work together. It broadly works with in terms of the interagency. How do we bring in CISA? How do we bring in the FBI? How do we bring in other elements of our government to ensure a safe and secure election? And then the final piece, how do we bring the private sector? How do we ensure the private sector that knows so much about what's going on is able to contribute to the security of our democratic processes? Secondly, it sends a warning to Russia and China, Iran and North Korea that we are capable actors, the best actors, the best hackers offensively and the best defenders. No doubt, a message was sent by our action. You know, in the old days, we had a term for the, the way that we approached the defense of a lot of our networks. We call that clean up on aisle nine. We'd seen our adversaries steal our intellectual property, steal our personal identifiable information, try to influence our elections, and the role that was left to us was clean that all up. After 2018, that stops. And the idea of being able to defend forward, persistently engage with your adversaries, bring a series of partners, comes to the fruition. Okay, 2018 midterm elections is incredibly important in terms of our development as a force. Let me share with you a story that perhaps is not as well known. Who will forget COVID-19? So it's the spring of 2020, and 
all of us are starting to grasp this idea of a global pandemic. I think many of you remember you know, the challenges of finding hand sanitizer or looking for personal protective equipment or understanding really where this pandemic was going as so many of our countrymen were becoming sick and many losing their lives. In the spring of 2020, the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the Secretary of the Department of Defense came together and said, we need to develop a vaccine. A vaccine that can be designed, tested, and deployed, not in years, but in months. And this idea became known as Operation Warp Speed. Now, the part of the story that involves the National Security Agency and U.S. Cyber Command is the fact that the Secretary of Defense came to me and said, Paul, I want to make sure as this vaccine is developed by Health and Human Services and a series of private sector companies that we protect the design phase, the test phase, and the detection phase. Let me be honest with all of you. When I took over as the director of the National Security Agency and Commander U.S. Cyber Command, I don't remember the part of the instruction about global pandemic, and I don't remember the part of the instruction about working with a series of partners that were broader than perhaps the Secretary of Defense's remit and the defense in uh, industrial base. But this is where the power of what we do comes together. Because here's what we did. First of all, take what is our platform at the National Security Agency and garner as much foreign intelligence as possible. What are the Chinese and what are the Russians doing? How are they planning for what they want to do? What is their tradecraft as they look at the development of a vaccine within the United States? Secondly, let's have a hostage exchange. A hostage exchange taking our best people and putting them in places like Health and Human Services or pharmaceutical companies to understand how do you actually develop a vaccine? What's your network look like? How do you test it? What's the assurance that you have as this vaccine is developed? And the final piece is how do you coordinate all of this seamlessly to make sure that what is being done is being done based upon what we're seeing our threat do? And this was the work, this was the work of Ann Neuberger who is the Director of Cybersecurity for the National Security Agency. Persistent in her approach, being able to bring together partners, being able to understand that there are truly vulnerabilities in a number of our government networks that had to be patched. It wasn't perfect, but I will tell you that we were persistent about it. And we reached out to a series of partners that we had never dealt with before. And what was the result? A vaccine that was delivered in record time two weeks before the date in December of 2020. Secondly, the safe development, testing, and distribution of 300 million doses of a vaccine that addressed COVID-19. And finally, and most importantly, to the work of those pharmaceutical companies, to Health and Human Services, and to our agency in command, the realization that that vaccine saved thousands and thousands of lives. That's the work of bringing together what our government does best and what the private sector does well, uh, well as well. So this was really kind of the end of 2020. And it was a busy year. And we were thinking that everything was really good as we had a safe and secure election, as we were dealing with a number of adversaries in cyberspace, as we were able to develop a vaccine until an unannounced visitor comes to the National Security Agency the Tuesday before Thanksgiving 2020. Any time that Kevin Mandia comes to the National Security unannounced, I get nervous. I would tell you, though, that Kevin came to talk about something he was incredibly nervous about, the Russians within his network. He had started to see a series of patterns within Mandian that concerned him. As he came to NSA and talked about it, we were able to confirm some of the things that we were seeing as well. This became known as solar winds. Many of you recall this. The supply chain attack by the SVR within Russia, 
against a number of different companies within the United States. Hey, what was unique about this? What was unique about this is the fact that we have an adversary that understands our authorities and laws almost as well as we do. As they bought a series of VPSs within the United States, brought them up, conducted their operations, and took them down before we could ever get a warrant. The idea of not only being able to impact tens or hundreds, but 18,000 different victims with a supply chain attack. That means the defense industrial base. That means Microsoft. That means Deloitte. That means Cisco. That means the Health and Human Services, Treasury, Department of State. An incredibly powerful intrusion that was discovered, first of all, by Mandian, confirmed by our agency, and then dealt with by the private sector. But if that was just one intrusion in 2020-21, I would have been happy. But that was quickly followed by Microsoft Hafnium in March. And then who will forget Colonial Pipeline? 43% of the petroleum products that flow through the East Coast flow through Col Colonial Pipeline. And then, of course, as we think about the summer, a series of different ransomware attacks that were conducted by adversaries and criminals against JBS, among the largest food purveyors in the United States. So think about this. In six months from the time Kevin Mandia comes on our doorstep at NSA to really the end of it, we've seen supply chain, we've seen zero day, we've seen ransomware. So what's our playbook at the agency in command? Here's our playbook. Our playbook begins with intelligence. It's being able to take what we do so well in terms of our foreign intelligence and be able to apply it to what is going on. Secondly, it has always been my posture that when you're in a difficult time and not understanding what your adversaries are doing, unleash your hackers. We unleash the hackers of NSA and Cyber Command to understand exactly what Russia or China or a series of criminals are trying to do in terms of zero days, ransomware, or supply chain. The third part is bring a series of new partners together. So bring the partners within the interagency. Bring FBI and DHS to the party. Bring also this idea of your international partners. So whether or not it's the Five Eyes, the English-speaking countries of the world, that's the US, UK, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, or a series of broader partners. Whether or not it's countries within the Indo-Pacific region that understands China well, or whether or not it's countries within Europe that understands Russia well the more the merrier. And then finally, bring the private sector and have this discussion. The way that we were able to get after solar winds was the fact that we had a very, very brave and forward-thinking CEO in Kevin Mandia coming to us to be able to understand what was going on and then being able to talk about it publicly. So what's my assessment? Where are we at with all of this with regards to ransomware and criminal attacks? Our attribution is much better. Our partnership is growing. Our intelligence is really good. But I would tell you, bottom line is, we're not keeping up. We are not keeping up. We need a new strategy. We need increased pressures on countries like Russia that allow hackers to conduct criminal attacks into different countries within the world. And we need some new and innovative ideas to be able to address the profit motive and the profitability of what these criminals are doing. So if that was all it was with regards to what's going on in cyberspace, that would be one thing. But this has been followed over the past year by even greater concerns that I have with regards to the state of our cybersecurity. Many have heard that in March and May of 2020, 2023, the National Security Agency, FBI, DHS, and CISA released a report about pre-positioning in our critical infrastructure and key resources. Pre-positioning by an actor that's named Volt Typhoon that's tied to the Chinese government. The idea that this actor is living off the land, living off the land, the idea of being able to not have any signatures, not having any known indicators, 
but be able to take the resources that are available at their, at their disposal at the place and time of their choosing to create havoc within our critical infrastructure. And whether or not that critical infrastructure is in the Pacific, whether or not the critical infrastructure is in the United States, the intent here is an intent not to gather intelligence. It's an intent to cause havoc within our country in a time and place of our adversaries choosing. The bad news is we have Volt Typhoon within our critical infrastructure. The good news is we found them. And so now that we've found them, what do we have to do? The first thing is we need to make sure that we talk about this publicly all the time. China needs to own this type of behavior. We need to point it out. We need to make sure that a spotlight is shined on this at all times. Secondly, we need to discuss with a series of nations this idea of a diplomatic approach to saying that our critical infrastructure is off limits. No prepositioning and targets that are aimed at our civilian populations. Thirdly, after decades, after decades of spending tremendous amounts of money, tremendous amounts of time, exhortations with regards to the state of cybersecurity, we're still not there. Our patching is still lacking. Our cybersecurity levels are incredibly low. And so today at DEF CON 32, I encourage all of you, take a look at the AI cyber challenge that DARPA has presented. Take a look at Northgate and the idea of being able to bring a series of ideas to bring scope and scale to the problem of cybersecurity. And finally, we need a larger force. We need a larger force that's able to address a series of nation state actors or a series of criminals that are conducting this. And whether or not that's being able to bring a larger force with greater partners, a larger force with technology, or a larger force with a broader private sector, we need it. So change is also in printing not only what's going on in cybersecurity, but I will also tell you the character of warfare and our national security. What do I mean by the character of warfare? This character of warfare is the idea of how nations be able to organize or equip or conduct operations during wartime. And today, it's being done largely within the digital domain. I show here the Magura V5, a fascinating approach that the Ukrainians have taken towards battling the Russian Black Sea Fleet. You know, when the Russians invaded Ukraine in February of 2022, the Ukrainian Navy had no ships. Yet, in a little over two years, the Ukrainian Navy, utilizing a series of approaches that bring their hackers together, that bring their industrial private sector partners together, that brings technology together, have developed platforms like these that have sunk over a third of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. That's $500 million in damages. What does one of those platforms cost? $250,000. That's it. And guess what? An operator utilizes a simple laptop with a Starlink connection that allows that platform to approach 40 miles an hour, travel about 400 kilometers, and deliver a lethal impact of 700 to 800 pounds of explosive. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the future of warfare. That's the changing character of warfare that's playing together and playing before our eyes right now. I would tell you, much as the book in the 1990s said, it's not the big that eat the small, it's the fast that eat the slow. And this is the fast eating the slow. Hey, but there's been a bigger picture. It's not only just the changing character of warfare, it's the changing nature of our national security. Think about the national security, how it's changed over the past five years. We've dealt with a global pandemic. We've dealt with cybersecurity. We've dealt with terrorism. We've dealt with fentanyl. 
And guess what? The idea of two broad oceans and two friendly neighbors protecting our country doesn't hold up to this type of broader change in character of what's coming at us. So this idea of national security has changed. The idea of being one power in the world is being replaced by many powers in the world. The rising importance of China, both diplomatically, informationally, militarily, and economically, is playing out. You know, I entered the service when there was really a binary approach to what we did, a binary approach of either you're at peace or you're at war. Today, we're in a rheostat of aggressive competition, competition within our information sphere, our economic sphere, crisis or conflict. It's our job to ensure that we maintain this idea of aggressive competition, that we ensure that we are able to mitigate the crises that appear and deter the conflicts that are in the future. So what do we need to do? I mean, what goes on in terms of being able to approach this? First of all, I would tell you that there are three things that we should be thinking about. First of all, new strategies and new ideas. In the fall of 2021, the United States government released a number of sensitive reports about what Russia was going to do in Ukraine. Guess where a lot of those reports came from? Can you imagine being Dernza and having those discussions with a series of Russian analysts that have spent decades of their life collecting this information, you say something like this. Uh, hey, you know that information that we've been collecting for decades uh, about Russia, some of the most sensitive information that we have? Uh, we're gonna go ahead and release that to the world. Yeah, it was kind of like this, a complete silence. But if you think about it, if we're able to do that, if we take our competitive advantage, which is our intelligence, and if we can protect our sources and methods, if we do it in a manner that builds a coalition, disrupts an adversary like Russia, and enables a partner like the Ukrainians, that sounds like it's in our national interest. Why wouldn't we do that? And this is the broader approach I would tell you, and one of the things I'm most proud of about the National Security Agency is taking a look at how do we do things more transparently. Many of you have seen the tool Ghidra that we released in 2019. Can you imagine the conversation we had about releasing Ghidra in 2019? Yeah, it was fascinating. But it's also been followed up by initiatives like the Cybersecurity Collaboration Center, this idea that, hey, within the NSA, we should not only get, but give from the private sector. How do we work with over 2,000 partners in the defense industrial base and provide them information and also gather information from them about what's going on? I call that this idea of almost the canary in the coal mine. This is the spirit of new ideas and new approaches that we need given the changing environment of national security. Here's the second thing that we need. We need unique partnerships. Unique partnerships, partnerships that consider ransomware, partnerships that consider Chinese prepositioning within our critical infrastructure, partnerships that are able to get after the increasingly challenged difficulty of dealing with ransomware. You know, this idea of unique partnerships, this idea of unique partnerships, it's not only that we have to keep up with the threat, We've got to be ahead of the threat. And we need greater partnerships between what we do in the government and what many of you do as you do your own operations. You are the experts that operate in gray space. You are the ones that first see things that are unique. For someone who was at the Pentagon on 9-11, the thing that I take most from that experience is is the fact that if you see something, say something. So we need all of you working with organizations like the Cyber National Mission Force, a unit I once commanded, under advisement, their program to be able to understand what's going on in the private sector. Or it's working with CISA, an ability to share this information. We need this. We need your assistance, we need your expertise. 
we need to understand what's going on as well. And then finally, we need to maintain the trust and confidence. One of the key lessons that I took as the director of the National Security Agency was maintaining the trust and confidence of what we do with the American people. Incredible authorities, incredible surveillance capabilities that are provided to the National Security Agency. I'm a private citizen who believes strongly, just as I did when I was the director of the National Security Agency, that oversight is a must. That scrutiny is good, that we should always understand what our intelligence community is doing. But I would also tell you that we will not be transparent all that we can do. We just cannot do that. The adversaries that we have faced today, whether or not it's Russia, China, Iran, or North Korea, require us an ability to understand what they're doing and protect that information. You know, one of the things that I would tell you that after six months being retired, I do think a lot about the things that perhaps I should have done, both being commander and director. One of the things that I am certain I should have done is come and address DEF CON as the acting, during, or the acting commander. Much in the same way DT talked today about building a community, this is a community that we need to build. And so it's my hope that future Dernses and commanders will make sure that their speaking tour is stopping here at Vegas, at DEF CON 33, and beyond. So as I got ready to retire, I had a lot of options. Uh, and I would tell you the number one option that I wanted to do was to be able to give back. And so I'm now the founding director of the Institution of National, National Security at Vanderbilt University. In 40 days, we're going to launch this new institute. This is a university, Vanderbilt, that is world class. This is a university that's able to take a look at a series of problems and approach them with expert faculty, with unique partnerships, and with an interagency approach to looking at how we get things done across a number of different silos within academia. It's also an institute. It's a, excuse me. We there? OK, sorry about that. It's also an institute that's going to take artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and intelligence for decision making, and apply that to the program that we're developing. You know, one of the interesting things that I found in my travels across the United States when I was the director and commander was I would show up on the West Coast or Austin or Boston, Massachusetts, and I was normally twice the age of the people I was talking to. And then I'd come back to DC, and I was one of the younger ones in the room. <laughs> 15 times more people are over the age of 50 than under the age of 30 working national security issues today. We need to change that. And this institute at Vanderbilt University is our approach to be able to start that momentum. So I invite all of you, those that have done so much of the work that has been able to build our economy and understand what our nation does in cyberspace to join us. Later on today, please see Brett Goldstein, who will be here to talk about what you might be able to do to join our journey as we take a look at a new Institute for National Security. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your patience and your attention. Best wishes for DEF CON 32. Thanks a lot.